in a series called, But I Tell You. And really what it is, is we've been looking at Jesus challenging the people who were following him and listening to him. He was challenging their worldview. He was coming before them and he was turning things upside down in terms of how they viewed things. He flipped their worldview upside down, very much like when we hear the word even today challenging the worldview that each and every one of us has. And you may be going, well, what's a worldview? I, do I have a worldview? And so forth. Everybody has a way of looking at life and the world around them. It's shaped by a number of questions. We, we may not even think maybe consciously about some of these questions, but questions like, is there, is there a God? What's the meaning of life? What's truth? How do I navigate the current circumstances of my life? What should I believe? How do I process politics? How do I process relationship? I mean, there are a number of things that are essential questions. Like, what is the meaning of life is a huge question. Why am I here? What's, what's my value? What's going to happen to me when I die? Those are all deep questions that form and shape how we think about the world around us and our future, our own lives. And that's what Jesus came to do was he, especially today when we get into this parable, he's, he's coming and he's, he's giving a kingdom of God parable and he's trying to shape and, and reshape and challenge how people view their current lives. Here's what I would say, that having a historical worldview is essential if we're going to be different than the world we live in. And the reason why I say historical is because what we want to do is we want to look at how we view life, how we view the world around us through the Bible, but not only the Bible, but the historical long-standing interpretation of the Bible. Because there's so many things right now that are being redefined in our culture and so for us, a historical worldview is as close as we can get to what Jesus spoke about in the Gospels. So that's why we want to focus on that. And I guess my question for you this morning is, does your view of the world and life line up with what the Bible says? We come in here this morning and we praise and worship and everything's good, but when we leave here and we go about our lives... Do the decisions that we make, are they formed out of what the Word of God says? It's an important question to ask ourselves. But in Matthew 13, Jesus says to his disciples, he says, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. You see, Jesus uses this parable in Matthew 13. If you guys want to get your Bibles open, we're going to be in Matthew 13 today. He uses this parable to teach about the kingdom of God and our receptivity to it. He uses this parable. This is a kingdom of God parable challenging us to receive what he has, not what the world tells us. It's important to us. It's really important to us. Jesus says the kingdom of God comes by carefully hearing the word, understanding it, and receiving it into our hearts. Understanding the kingdom of God is vital if we're going to be set apart, different people than the world we live in that we're going to be the salt and the light, the, 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 the city on a hill, that people look at us and go, there's something different about those people. Well, it comes back to what do we believe about God and his mission for our lives? And are we willing to live that out so that we can indeed be set apart? So I want to talk about the kingdom of God for a minute because it is radically different than the kingdom of this world, radically different. If you think about it, earthly kingdoms come by way of force, might, and coercion. Get it? When Alexander the Great came, as the Greeks marched in, 
He said, it's either my way or the highway. You either follow what I'm saying, what I've laid out, or you're dead. The Romans were no different. The Romans came in and they said, this is how you are to live your lives within our kingdom. And we see a lot of this even over in Eastern Europe right now, where the Russians have just gone into the Ukraine and dictated to them how, tried to dictate to them how they're to fall under their control, their kingdom. Every one of us is very aware of how the kingdom of this world operates. But if you think about Jesus, he's so radically different. He came in the absolute opposite spirit. He came wanting us to receive him by listening, understanding him, and inviting us into a relationship with him where we can be in a humble, transparent relationship with the king of the universe, the king of the kingdom of God. Amen? And I, I, there's so many examples that we have with the, the analogy between it. I mean, the, the kingdom of the world comes in with tanks and guns, right? Just comes blazing in and says, this is what you're to do. The kingdom of God comes by way of the cross. Are you kidding me? It's radically in opposition. The kingdom of the world comes into control behavior. You will do as I say. The kingdom of God comes in and Jesus says, I want to transform you from the inside out so that your hearts are changed and that your behavior reflects the king, me. Amen? Radically different. The kingdom of the world says, we're going to get back at our enemies. Jesus says, we're to love our enemies. Do you guys see the radical difference and the shift between the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God that Jesus came to introduce and to share? That's what the gospels are about, you guys. They're powerful. And I was thinking about this. So um, I like to cut my fields. I have a brush hog and a tractor. Some of you guys do as well. And these are the earmuffs that I wear when I'm cutting the field. And I put these earmuffs on because all I want to do is tune out, make nice straight rows down my field, cut all the grass down, but I don't want to hear any rocks. Anybody in here hate the sound of hitting rocks with your brush hog? It's scary, right? But I was thinking about it. What are the things in my life that I don't want to hear? What are the things that I want to tune out? Is anybody in here tune certain things out? Just like, I don't want to hear that. That is too close to home, right? I just want to cut my field. Hearing and seeing, when you, when you hear the word hearing and seeing in the Bible, it's related to a spiritual dynamic. It's related to us hearing what God has to say and receiving it at a heart level. Very important, understanding spiritual truths and the impact of them on our hearts. And so, so often we don't, we want to tune stuff out that God says, because let's, let's face it, the kingdom of this world can supply us with the things that we think we need. Did you hear that? So like, you, there's probably things that you're aspiring to have that if you do X, Y, and Z, that you can obtain those. The question is, is that in alignment with the kingdom of God? Because if it's not, and all we want a God for is to take care of our problems, that is the wrong way to think about the kingdom. So how should we think about the kingdom? Well, in this, in this wonderful parable, Jesus says the kingdom comes like a seed. And I want you to think about this for a minute. The seed represents the word. It's this gentle, vulnerable, and humble message. Radically opposite. It's not a tank that comes in, you must believe, but God has given each of us free will to receive what he has. And what's so fascinating about the kingdom of God is it starts with this tiny, humble seed 
that can grow and spread across the world because it lives in the hearts of its believers who live their lives out in a powerful, transformational way. It's so crazy when you think about the kingdom of this world coming by force, and what did Jesus do? But he came and sacrificed himself for each and every one of us on the cross. You guys, that's foolishness to this world. It's foolishness. It's crazy. Jesus did this so we could have intimate relationship with him where he can change us again from the inside out. And here's what I would say. Sometimes, matter of fact, in my life, often that change comes through heat and pressure. Can you relate to that? What in your lives right now are you experiencing the heat and the pressure of the things in this world that are super challenging? Anybody in here going through that right now? We can all laugh about it. But I want to start by reading Matthew 13. Starting in verse 1, if you have your Bibles, turn there. This is, a, this is a powerful parable. That same day, Jesus went out. I'm going to give you context in a minute. So I'm just going to read it, and then we'll do some context in a little bit. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. He often did this, where he would get away because the crowds were so close to him. He'd get away from them enough to be able to speak to all of them on the shore. So that's what he does. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and he was scattering the seed. Some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, It sprang up quickly, but the soil was shallow. But when the sun came, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Listen to verse 9. He who has ears, let him Hear, let him hear. So let's just dive in. What is a parable? I know this is for some very basic, but if you think about a parable, it is a story or a teaching aid that comes alongside of some spiritual truth. And Jesus was a master at using stories. I imagine that the people on the shore, there were many farmers And so he read his audience and his parable, what came alongside the truth was an analogy that the farmers understood about someone who would cast seeds. A parable, the word parabole, literally means something cast alongside something else. And honestly, as disciple makers, it is a phenomenal way to help people understand things, and even teaching your kids. Because there's some unique things about the parable. Jesus' disciples are with him in the boat, and they say to him, they ask him the question, why do you use parables? And here's here's what Jesus says in Matthew 13, 10. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets the secrets of the heaven of, of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled in the prophecy of Isaiah. So Jesus has some pretty profound things, but he's telling his disciples why parables. You see, he's introducing kingdom concepts to these people, and he's doing it in such a way that they have to lean in and listen. They have to actually hear 
what he's saying, not tune him out, but truly listen. Now, the seed is the word of God, and Jesus is revealing his kingdom plan for the earth and even the future. These concepts required great thinking and question asking. They required people to listen and to think, and to be introspective, and try to figure it out. They even provoked people with more questions. It wasn't like he just said, do this, do this, do this. He came, and he presented this story to them with this huge spiritual truth and implication for each of their lives, and he says, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? These parables cause the hearers to think. And I hope when you open the word, especially as parables, and you look at them, that you think, that you access the gray matter in your brain, starting there, and you ask yourselves very important questions. And see, I I believe our culture today is pretty much a non-thinking culture. I believe we just want God to fix our problems. We want the quick pill. We don't want to think long and hard about it. We're too busy. We have too many other important things to be involved with. But Jesus has something to say about those who are dull and lazy. If you look at verse 12 of Matthew 13, here's what he says. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. I don't know if you've thought about what that actually means, but what Jesus is saying is whoever has a spiritual appetite, whoever has a sensitivity for the word of God, whoever spends time and thinks deeply about what God is saying, God will reveal more. But the opposite is also true. Whoever doesn't and who thinks they have all this wisdom from God If they don't think and spend time and hear correctly, they're going to have less. They're going to have less. I was thinking about speaking to people that I believe were on fire for Jesus at one time. I don't know to what extent, but then drifting away. And I don't know if you guys have ever had a discussion with someone that said, well, I used to pursue God and I did this and that. The things that they share are so dull and so empty and hollow. They think, they hold and retain wisdom, and yet if they don't feed and protect and grow in what God is saying, they're becoming more dull. That's what Jesus is saying right here. Matthew 13, 13 through 15, listen to this. Jesus says, this is why I speak to them in perils, parables. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. So let's talk a little context. Jesus, at this point in the parable, is going back to the Old Testament, and he's referring to the prophet Isaiah. And if you know the story of the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah is called, uh, 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 Israel has become two divided kingdoms. After Solomon died, it turned into a complete train wreck, and they had war against one another, and they divided. The north and the south, 10 tribes of the north, two tribes to the south. Judah and Benjamin. That's where Israel is today, okay? Isaiah is this prophet that God calls to the nation of Judah primarily. And what's fascinating in chapter 6 of Isaiah, it starts off by saying, in the year that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah was a good Judah king. He was, a, he, he was for the most part, led the nation well and was respected by the people. However, in his older age, Uzziah 
decided to take things in his own, and he decided he would go burn incense in the temple, and God turned him into a leper. It's a pretty bummer deal for this guy that had a really good ministry for a long time, and all of a sudden he slips up, and he does something, and God's not happy with him. He was warned by his priest, don't do it, and he was bullheaded, and he charged in, and he did it. And now here's Isaiah, because because. Because Isaiah is looking at the world around him and this, what is what am I supposed to do? And he's bumming out because this king that sat on the throne of Judah is now a complete mess and the people are drifting. God takes him in and gives him this vision. And many of you know this text where Isaiah sees, he, he goes into the Holy of Holies and he's blown away. He sees God, and he sees this temple, this heavenly kingdom, not not the, the power of Uzziah's kingdom, but now God shows him this unbelievable kingdom that is not of this world, and he sees this large train, and the whole the, the Holy of Holies is filled with smoke, and the seraphim are singing, holy, holy, holy. It is this unbelievable scene. And what does Isaiah do? He drops to his knees and he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. The seraphim go to the hot fire and pull out coals and they touch his lips. Isaiah says, I I am a sinful man. I live among a sinful people. Then God asks a rhetorical question, whom shall I send? And Isaiah responds, I'll go, Lord. That's the commissioning of Isaiah, the prophet. Now, think about this for a minute. I'll go, Lord. Now God tells him. So then Isaiah says, okay, I'll go. And then now Isaiah asks the Lord a question. What am I to say? How long am I to do it? What does God say? This is a people that is ever hearing, but they don't hear anything. They're looking, but they don't see anything. They are spiritually dull. It is the same picture that Jesus is addressing in the New Testament when he's walking among the people. And it is the same picture of the world that we live in today. We are drawn. We are constantly, because of our sin nature, pulled away from yielding to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we we fall in love with the kingdom of the world. And Jesus is saying, no, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is so much more profound. It's like, can you imagine Isaiah for a minute? What am I, how long am I supposed to preach this repentant news to the people? What does God say? Until they are taken captive because they've been disobedient. Isaiah had the most bummer job on planet earth. If you could believe this. It's like, as a prophet, you could not get assigned a more depressing message. Repent, 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 repent to a people that would not turn back to God. Yet he was faithful. Jesus is reflecting on Isaiah and what happened with the people. So let's go back to the parable for a minute and see what Jesus, what his meaning and intent of this parable truly is. He says in verse 18, listen then to the parable of what the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they, since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, hear that, because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. 
This parable is a test for you and I to see what kind of soil we are, to, to really be introspective about where is the soil of our heart in relationship to the kingdom of God, what Jesus is calling us to become so that he can use us to spread the gospel. So there's four soil types that relate to four conditions of the heart to hear. The hard heart, which is the first soil type, people who bear or who hear intellectually, but they never believe. You know someone like that? They hear intellectually, it's between their ears. But the soil of their hearts are hard. The good news of the kingdom falls on hard soil and it cannot penetrate. Do you realize that when you cast seed, the seed actually has to penetrate if it's going to germinate and grow? If the soil is hard, the seed can't germinate, and therefore it will not produce anything. It's hard. The only way our hearts become hard, people, is because of sin. Sin. Jesus came to free us from the bondage of sin so that he could give us new hearts to till our soil, to receive what he has so that we could be the very people he's called us to be. But we have to respond to that. I was thinking about a couple of years ago, I, I have this patio in the back with pavers and the grass only went about halfway around it. And I was like, well, I'm going to go out there and spread some seed. And I remember going out there, I spread the seed, I watered it real good, I was trying to take care of it. And I kept going to Christy, it's like, the grass isn't growing. And I'm like, this is crazy. So finally one morning, really early, I'm up, and I see the problem, the turkeys. <laughs> They're eating all the seed. And I'm like, well, duh, it's no wonder. So I went out there, reseeded again. Mark, I didn't shoot him, by the way. But um, I went out there and reseeded them, and then I covered it with some grass. And what I was doing was I was trying to give the seed, I was protecting the seed and giving it time to germinate in the soil without someone coming and snatching it away. Anybody in here like turkeys? Thanksgiving, that's right. Oh, my goodness. Well, how, are you guarding the word of God in your hearts. A hard-hearted person hears in the theoretical. In the theoretical. And this is hard to hear. You know, let's be honest. We, we love to be on the throne of our lives. And when God's seed, his word comes in and begins to convict us about a, a way that we're viewing things or our worldview that might be a little wonky and is not in alignment, we want to go back to this, right? There is a challenge here. Well, the second soil is a shallow heart. A person who professes excitement and enjoyment with the word. However, their heart is not changed. When trouble arises, their faith quickly disappears. We've all, we've all seen that. A shallow-hearted person hears in the emotional so a hard-hearted person hears in the theoretical, a shallow-hearted person hears in the emotional. There's a difference there. Say so they move past the theoretical into the emotion, but they don't truly understand the meaning of the word because as they hear it, they don't necessarily take it to heart. They allow the emotion of it to make them feel good, but they don't dig in and create the soil needed for roots to go deep. They don't comprehend truth. And if you don't have roots, you cannot withstand the heat of this world. A shallow-hearted person is the one who wants God to bless their kingdom, but when he doesn't, they're like, adios, God. You guys ever, you ever heard that? I tried God. He didn't what? Work for who? Me. That is Kingdom of the world thinking, not kingdom of heaven thinking. You guys see the difference there?
Is Jesus your service provider? That's what shallow-hearted people use Jesus for. I need you to do something for me. Be my service provider. You know, the two, the first two soils are, I, I'm going to go out and limb, on a limb and say, these two soils are indications that neither one of these people actually have a relationship with God, that they're even saved. It's not for me to judge, but I look at it and I'm like, don't see the fruit there, but soil three is the hard one. I want you guys to process this for a minute. Soil three, the divided heart, this person hears the word, receives it, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth make them unfruitful. And I would say that we can all wrestle here, right? We can all wrestle here. But Jesus gives us a couple simple statements in the book of Matthew that help us navigate the challenges of a divided heart. Number one, Matthew 6.34, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. The worries of this life, Jesus says, if you trust me, I will walk you through those. But if you allow the worries of this life to climb into your heart and consume your heart, the fruit in your life will be choked out. Matthew 6.24, no one can serve two masters Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Challenging, isn't it? The deceitfulness of wealth is what Jesus says of the third soil type, that it comes and chokes it out. The divided heart person lets the competing voices of this world step on and choke out the voice of God. Do you have that slide you can put up there, Rose? So I, I went out in my field. That's cow vetch. Has anybody seen cow vetch this year? It has taken over everything. This is the big, in 30 years, this is the biggest cow vetch year I can ever remember. It's everywhere. It's a plant, but what is it doing right now to everything around it? It's choking it out, right? It's cow vetch. It's a picture you could take that off. It's a picture of a divided heart. You know, I, I, we had a friend come over that's just new to the area, and he said, "What?" he says to Christy and I, he goes, what is this beautiful purple bloom going all over here? It, it actually, it looks, I mean, it makes everything look nice. It's purple, right? You guys, you guys okay with purple, right? I mean, it looks nice. It's not good, though, is it? There are things in this world that look really, really nice to us, but they're not good for us. A divided heart. What's competing? You're in a place where you feel like you can't overcome issues in your life. You feel like you have no joy. You keep circling the mountain. You come back to the same place over and over again. The question is, do you have a divided heart? Is there something competing with the voice of God, the Spirit of God, who wants to bring liberty and transformation to your heart? The fourth soil, and worship team, you can start working your way up. The fourth soil, a fruitful heart. The person hears the word and seeks to understand it, to apply it to their lives, and listen to this, and adjust their lives to actually live out the truth being taught. That's what Jesus was after when he was using parables and he was talking to people. He was scattering and, and sharing the truth of the kingdom, and he was inviting them to lean in, to understand, to ask questions, to wrestle with it, to really, really struggle through it so that it became what? Their own. They owned it. Not through coercion, not through might, but through a yielded heart that could see truth and then the Holy Spirit coming on that and like painting it in beautiful color, in beautiful living color. 
The fruitful heart people live out a consistent, abiding relationship with Jesus. A consistent time that you spend feeding yourself on the Word, hearing the Word, asking good questions about the Word, digesting the Word, and protecting the Word. Right? Letting God... Yeah, this is a prayer. If if you're in this place today where you're just stuck, here's the, the, the most beautiful prayer that you could pray. Lord... I give you access to till the soil of my heart. Because that's what God wants to do. Because when your heart softens, when he takes your hard heart and he breaks it and tills the soil and you abide and you remain in the word, that word now goes in deep and puts roots down. And when the challenge of this life, the heat, the wind, the rain, all that stuff blows on us, we can withstand it because we are rooted, founded, on the rock of Jesus. Can I get an amen? People with a fruitful heart know if they want to make a lasting difference in this life, they will reflect Jesus' words even when they think no one's watching. You ever done, you ever done that? Like, I know I need to do the right thing, but I'm tempted to not, and I'm going to look and see if there's anybody around that might bust me, especially one of my Christian brothers or sisters, right? A fruitful heart says, I'm going to hold fast to what I know is true, to what God has given me, because he's given me this eternal picture, this promise to the future that Jeremy talked about that I can hold on to and that I can stand upon even when things are hard. person that has a fruitful heart is one who is willing to yield to what God says above and beyond what their flesh cries out for, right? Battle between flesh and spirit, we're all, we all, we're all aware of that. God, in his mercy and his grace, wants to put a faithful, fruitful heart in our, in our hearts, in our inner person, in who we are. And he says, I will supply you with everything that you need. All I'm asking that you do is humble yourself, turn to me, and receive what I have for you, recognizing you need me. And I will put in your heart the very things of the kingdom of God so that each and every one of us can make a difference on planet Earth. Isn't that cool? What signs do you see in your life that you may have become hard-hearted? Think about it. Are you looking for God to bless your plans and make your life easy? Oof. Oof, that's tough. Is your heart so crowded with things of this world that you, that you are stuck and you can't move forward? Where do you have divided loyalties that you need to surrender to God? Things to ponder, you guys. All good things. The Word of God, it's so good, it's so true. He loves us all. He desires that we humble ourselves, yield to Him, follow Him, and He'll give us everything we need. Amen? But you know what? This is worth just standing up and praising God because His Word is so good. Amen? Amen?